Back with another project from Lizard Landscapes. We have a waterfall, gorge, lake, with a cave underneath the waterfall. This is based off of a well-known waterfall in the United States. So leave a comment as to your guess as to which uh, waterfall this is based off of. The only things that were not based off of uh, the reference photos was the lake and the cave that's underneath the waterfall. So, I've got an interesting uh, cutaway to the water feature that was rather challenging. Got about 120 trees, 120 pine trees that are in the project. And like I said, I've got a cave uh, underneath the waterfall feature. And what I did was puncture some holes in the top of that area to be able to, uh, you can see the holes there, to be able to shine some light in there to get this uh, lighting effect. So we've got quite a bit going on here. Some things that I had not um, done before and a level of detail and scale that I had not uh, tackled before as far as the water. This is about, as far as the scale, one inch represents about 105 feet. So that's your clue as to uh, which waterfall this is based off of. So this is a long one. Sit back, get some coffee, some tea, uh, settle in, and watch me create this waterfall diorama. All right, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're near an open window. So I'm gonna be using some hot wires from the hot wire foam factory. And you also want to be using a uh, professional gas mask. Just helps protect you from the fumes even though you have uh, adequate ventilation. So usually what I do is do a sketch, some sort of plan uh, to get an idea of what I'm gonna be doing. So it's based on uh, reference photos, but I always do a sketch in addition to that so drawing out this uh, first section, and this is how it really all started, was a piece of XPS foam, had already created uh, some of the trees, and knew that that landscape was basically going to be at a 45 degree angle with the trees uh, growing on that, and cutting out that first piece. And just to show that you don't necessarily need a hot wire, cutting out the uh, second section with a knife. So I've got the third section there trying to just line it up and uh, usually what I do is with all of these projects hold everything together with these pins and then later uh, once I'm happy with where the design is gone then uh, glue everything together so drawing out the uh, the river area and uh, just continuously building up uh, the landscape, all the while looking at the reference photos. Cutting away that uh, first section to create a bevel where it's going to be flush up against that back wall area. And this is how I created the trees. I'm going to leave a link in the description as to the video that I watched uh, going over this process, just taking pipe cleaners and uh, burning off some of the fibers to create a trunk and then using scissors to uh, get that shape of a pine tree and then obviously painting it uh, different colors you can even remove some of the fibers and expose the trunk and of course painting that trunk a uh, good brown color and adding some highlights Created some dead trees as well, that color that pine needles get, that sort of burnt orange with a little bit of brown and gray. And combine that burnt orange with a little bit of brown and gray and you get that sort of dead look. Really added quite a bit of color uh, 
to the diorama. So cutting away the back wall there. Sometimes it's a good idea to uh, take some paper and just draw out some ideas as a way of brainstorming. I really didn't know what I was going to do concerning the lake. And so just to be able to see it up against that uh, 3D portion of what I had already created and try to conceptualize like a curved cutaway to the water or having a flat cutaway. So cutting out the base, I knew I was going to have to build up that base because the uh, depth of the lake was close to three inches deep. So poking some holes through that design and doing this so that I know exactly uh, where the hot wire needs to start cutting because I've got uh, all of those marks which are basically adhering to that uh, design. So as I said, nothing is glued down as of yet, it's just held together with those pins, drawing out a design for, at that point, I thought it was going to be a flat, straight cutaway. So cutting out the uh, top portion and then the river below, and then finally the lake. So that's how it's looking at this point. Another way of looking at it is you've got the finished product on the right and it's in the exact same position as where we're at now in the project. So I've got that front section and I'm gonna take what is essentially a leftover piece. So in cutting out all of the pieces you see there, I've got all these extra little leftovers, uh, scraps that you can use. And in this case, uh, using that piece to create some uh, texture in forming the rock face. So using a razor blade to cut a bunch of horizontal cuts and then cutting vertically down to create this texture. Also trying to, uh, with pieces that are extending that rock face to extend the cracks in the rock uh, to help blend the, uh, the two pieces together. So just using more leftover pieces to fit it together like a puzzle. And that is the first piece I'd used uh, glue on. You just want to get to where you're comfortable and then uh, make decisions to start gluing. So this is a different uh, tool I hadn't used before. Basically an engraver tool from the Hotwire Foam Factory. So if you're not comfortable with the razor blade, this can uh, provide a, a way of just kind of effortlessly creating texture on XPS foam. I don't know how well it works on EPS foam, but for the most part, I was using a razor blade, as you can see here on a test piece. Another way of creating, you know, rocks is to literally cut out pieces and have them stacked on top of each other so that essentially the cracks in the rock are real. So progressively getting more comfortable with the project and taking out those pins and actually gluing pieces together. I've got the first and the second piece that I had uh, started with and created a wedge piece in there. So gluing the lake pieces down and finally the base. And that is what ended up being the cave. So at that point, there was no plan or design for that cave uh, to be carved out. That's, that is that section right there. And gluing, gluing that into place and gluing the uh, back walls into place. And started to really notice, even though there had not been a plan, that it was turning into this oval shape and just started to, decided to conform to that, just filling in these gaps. And speaking of gaps, you've got, I've got two pieces there that have been glued down, and yet there's this gap, another, or a good way of uh, filling that gap, taking another leftover piece, sticking it in there, and cutting off the excess. And just building up the rock face with, uh, small pieces to extend that landscape, creating a little piece to basically hold in that resin 
in the top uh, river area. And then with as far as the texture for the rocks, it was quite a few different tools, but for the most part, just using a razor blade to, as I said before, cutting uh, horizontal lines and then vertical lines to create texture. And then going back in with uh, finishing touches to create all of these little grooves that basically I will fill everything as far as those um, cracks with black paint and uh, then dry brush uh, varying colors of uh, gray and brown on top of that. So using a product that is uh, made for foam as far as gluing foam together, but in this case just really using it to add to the sculpture in building up a certain section of the landscape without having to cut out very small slivers of foam in order to do that. So you can use this as a, a way to sculpt uh, in small sections, as you can see there, creating a slope uh, for the waterfall. And for the most part, this, the rocks, boulders that uh, were in the project were made out of foam. There was quite a few real rocks, uh, as in gravel, but uh, gluing in quite a bit of these uh, rocks just made out of the same XPS foam. And have another leftover piece here where you can just pick a part at it and you know, dig your fingernail into it and create sort of a flat rock. So gluing in a whole bunch of rocks here, combining those later with real rocks. So here's an example of using that leftover piece that uh, carved into a flat rock where you can see the crack is extending into that piece. So gluing in some model railroad uh, foliage to, I didn't know how visible as far as the clarity with that deep of a resin, but just in case it was, uh, visible gluing in all kinds of things to create texture. So I kept turning the project around, noticing this area, thinking I should carve something into that. And so this is how the cave started. So using a hot wire, gouging into that, creating uh, a basic shape of a cave. So looking at reference photos again and creating this, uh, this indentation or suggestion of cave and then course creating another uh, water feature and just using a knife to create all kinds of uh, texture and grooves to sort of add to uh, the look of the cave and of course putting in some stalagmites and stalactites and uh, noticing when I was creating some of the texture in there, I was uh, accidentally breaking off some of these. So applying some glue to reinforce those because they were so small and fragile. And then sometimes putting in uh, some of the trees before you're actually ready to glue those in as a way of uh, looking at it and seeing, do I need to add this? Do I need to take away? Same thing with this using packing tape. This is actually what I ended up using to create that barrier for the resin. But at this point, it was just a way to look at it and try to visualize what is this going to look like with a curved cutaway or a flat cutaway to the water feature. So deciding to just conform to the shape of the uh, oval football shape that it was turning into, creating some pieces to extend, waiting for those uh, to dry, and then sanding them to conform more to the shape of that oval. And then cutting in some texture. So I've got some tools here that I use to puncture through the top of the waterfall to create those openings to be able to shine light down in there and, and get that uh, lighting effect. So testing it out there. So I didn't really know if this was going to work or how it was going to look. And then, of course, knowing I cannot glue anything to block that uh, light from getting through those openings. So coming, trying to come up with uh, ideas of how to create the barrier for the resin. 
I've got just a cheap plastic uh, container that uh, I cut up. Did not end up using that. Ended up uh, using the packing tape. So before that, I'm going to use essentially what is a white glue to mix that with water and apply a good layer over the entire project. And this is really just to strengthen it and uh, make sure everything is uh, glued down before I uh, apply a good layer of black paint as a way of underpainting. So I've got black paint and mixed with water. And I'm gonna apply a good layer to basically the entire thing. So this black paint is gonna seep into all of those cracks so that when I go back in later and do a series of layers of dry brushing, all of those cracks will still be visible. So mixing up some color here, got some white, black, and brown mixing whole bunch of different shades of uh, stone color. So this is really a process of just applying a whole bunch of different layers of color and letting quite a bit of the previous layer uh, remain there and just combining all different kinds of shades and colors to create this more uh, complex look to the rock. So I've got highlight colors. I've, I'm using brown, gray. You can really see the texture come alive uh, in all of that uh, black layer that I had initially put down as a base. And with acrylic paint, it does tend to dry dull, and uh, you need to go back in and reapply. So it was really quite a lengthy uh, process of going back and forth and trying to create texture and create more of a complex look to the rock face. And so initially I was going to create this border for the project and then just decided to uh, extend the texture of the rock face to the entire uh, perimeter of the project. So using a razor blade and just kind of digging in there, trying to create uh, cracks. So using some of that same stuff that is meant for gluing foam together uh, to fill in some of these gaps and uh, it's the type of uh, consistency where you can dig into it and sort of shape it like clay so trying to extend the uh, cracks in the in the texture so and then applying a good layer of sealant over that once it dries and then a layer of black and then going back in and dry brushing uh, to uh, get that texture to stand out. So, and then creating some, applying some color, sort of like a uh, clay color, as in different layers of uh, earth. And then having the base be a really dark color, dark brown, having that fade uh, upward as it gets lighter. So a good percentage of the cracks that are in the rock were just painted on. So it's just a really uh, easy way to add after the fact, because sometimes you really can't tell what you're getting without the color on there, and you get ideas later after you've done the sculpt. Then applying some brown paint to simulate dirt before I apply the ground cover. So applying some glue, and then sprinkling on some ground cover to uh, simulate the grass. And be sure and watch this intermission. All right, time for another intermission. This is where I go completely off topic and try to motivate those who haven't found God yet to start searching. A different way of putting it might be those who haven't found the truth yet. I realize there are those who have done a search and have arrived at a different path, and I respect that. This is really more for those like I used to be. I never really thought about the truth of where I might go or where I might not go when I passed away. Without articulating it back then, I was essentially hoping that the truth was what I wanted it to be. And of course that meant catering to my selfish desires and becoming an enabler of my own agenda. The point of this message is really for those who haven't searched for God to realize that it is worth your time to do so. 
There's an old saying that the majority of us do way more planning, research, and spend more time on where we're going to go and what we're going to do on a two-week vacation than where we could possibly spend eternity. Be careful that what you're believing to be the truth is not just what you're wanting to be the truth. The common response to this is, aren't you, meaning me, aren't you just wanting Christianity to be the truth? My response would be, and believe me, fellow Christians out there, I'm glad I know Christ now, but 12 years ago and beyond, I was not wanting Christianity to be the truth. I wasn't raised with Christianity and encountered it in my early 30s. It took a while for me to accept and embrace it. I didn't like how it did not cater to my selfish desires. To me, the words in red, the words of Christ, read like the truth, which wasn't always pleasing. The words were convicting and humbling and concerning. Instead of expecting the truth to align with what I wanted it to be, I decided to start aligning myself in thoughts and desires with what I believed was the truth, not with what I wanted to be the truth. This was really just the first step in becoming a believer and follower of Christ. I went back and forth in a battle because my old self didn't quite want to give up the old lifestyle but I experienced enough conviction and was impressed by the bold truth claims in the Bible to spark my interest. I knew that this was worth my time to pursue. I liked how some scriptures in the New Testament were blunt and jarring and demanded a response from the reader. It was not catering to me, but holding me accountable and yet doing so in an understanding, loving way. In these videos, I'm going to try to provide a short explanation as to why I believe in Christ specifically and why I went beyond that initial response of feeling conviction to arrive at believing Jesus Christ is the only way, truth, and life. I think a lot of people believe that Christians at some point randomly picked out their faith from a big bowl of choices and just by chance went with what they received. In reality, there are many things that would point toward Christ as being the truth. Take, for example, the first people who encountered the resurrected Christ were women. Scripture has women being the first to witness the risen Lord, and essentially they were the first to tell or preach that particular section of the gospel. This doesn't seem strange now, but it's highly unlikely that a first century writer trying to create a lie is going to choose women as the first witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. In the first century, women's testimony was not considered to be comparable to that of a man. Why would a liar in the first century incorporate it into a document whereby he's trying to convince others to follow it as the truth, when it would have given that document no credibility for that time period? Does it prove that the New Testament is true and accurate beyond a shadow of a doubt? No, but it's awfully compelling. This is just one of many details that the events of Christ were not developed as from a legend, but were accurately recorded, and suggests that it has not changed over time. I produced a question and answer video that touches upon this subject. I'll leave a link in the description. Please take the time to watch it. Hopefully the takeaway here is to realize searching for the truth is worthy of your time, and to be careful that what you're believing to be the truth is not what you're wanting the truth to be, but discovering the truth and then aligning yourself with it instead of expecting it to align with you. Thanks for listening. So this is how I created the ground cover. So I've got, you can use sawdust or dead plant or dead leaves, and you're basically trying to shred this into small particles so that you can combine it with acrylic paint into uh, different colors to be able to add to your your layout. So I'm spreading this out onto uh, wax paper. I'm going to allow this to dry and I'm basically going to try to sift this and create smaller particles uh, depending on the scale of uh, the model you're working on. So putting this into a coffee grinder as I said before, you can use leaves. Uh, a lot of people just use sawdust, but combining this with different colors of what you're going to want to use as far as uh, ground cover and applying that to your diorama. 
And it's a good idea to try to break up the look of the rock so that it's not just all rock face and uh, sprinkling some of that ground cover so that there's a little bit more of a variety. So what I did, I really don't know if this was necessary, but I ended up creating some holes in the lake to uh, provide sort of an anchor for the resin to seep in there. Uh, I didn't know if this was necessary, uh, considering the uh, cutaway was completely open. So I'm mixing together some uh, very dark aqua and applying that to all of the water sections. And mixing together some transitional colors because basically what I'm trying to do is go from a really dark aqua to this sort of sandstone color. So a probably much better way of doing this is just using an airbrush, but just to show that you can do this without having to purchase an airbrush, trying to create that uh, monochromatic scale from a dark aqua to uh, more of a land cover. So I really didn't, wasn't happy with those uh, holes I punctured in, but still wanted to leave some room for the resin to seep into, so applying some rocks in there. And doing the same thing to the other water features, trying to create that uh, color blend to suggest the depth or shallowness of the water. And of course, trying to paint uh, the cave, a whole bunch of different colors of black and, and gray, and sometimes using uh, a clay color. And then adding some highlights as far as like a light uh, beige and quite a few layers going back and forth. Wasn't really happy with it, but and then painting the uh, water feature and adding some of that uh, orange red clay color into the as if there's a reflection into the water. And then as a last stage, uh, dry brushing those colors together at the top where the water line is going to be. So this is really uh, the poor man's airbrush where you uh, obviously easier with an actual airbrush, but uh, dry brushing can really simulate that look of trying to seamlessly blend two colors together. And then gluing in that rock that is sort of left of center in the top area. So that's where we are currently in the project. And this is how I created that barrier for uh, the resin. So I've got three pieces of packing tape stuck together and I'm going to mark off where the edges are because I don't really want to go over uh, the amount that I actually need. And I'm going to go ahead and cut that out and then reapply that, sticking that onto the water area with some pins. And then once those are in place, I'm going to add a glue as a barrier. So I'm going to try to waterproof this in creating this thick uh, glue barrier and then doing a series of tests of actually using real water to make sure that uh, it's watertight. So before I do that, I'm going to apply the sealant, several layers of this sealant. And uh, before I do the uh, water test, so I'm going to do this to all of the, the water areas, I guess three that I've got. And then once that glue is dried that is holding that packing tape, and I'm going to remove those pins and basically do the exact same thing with the cave water feature in gluing that uh, piece of packing tape on there. So applying more layers of sealant just to make sure I don't have any leaks. Had quite a few leaks. You can see one there, sort of the center of your screen. And uh, going back in, because I know at that point it's on the left side, so I'm going to try to guess as to where that leak is coming from. And then uh, putting the entire project onto a paper towel, filling it only to like the halfway mark to do a test for leaks. So now if I've got a leak, I know it's coming from the halfway mark downward. So I've got a leak right there, so now I can go back in and work on that right side because I know where it's coming from. 
and from what depth. So doing the same thing with the cave water feature and progressively working up with the lake water feature and trying to test for leaks. So I waited, I don't know how long with this, uh, with actual water in there to make sure that it didn't have leaks, but finally progressed to the resin pouring stage. So mixing together some resin, you have to do quite a bit of mixing, uh, just follow the directions on whatever resin that uh, you purchase. So I've got a little homemade ruler there, which is kind of pathetic. I guess I uh, misplaced my normal ruler. So filling in the first layer with a uh, half inch of resin and then using the rest of that batch to uh, pour into the other water features and then covering that up uh, so something doesn't accidentally fall in there. Leaving that for 24 hours to cure and then so each layer that I pour is roughly a half inch and there's 24 hours of wait time, cure time before I uh, pour the next layer. So a good way of measuring is to wait for one layer to completely cure, pouring actual water in there to the to the depth that you want it to be, pouring that into a cup, measuring that, and you can get a perfect measurement as far as uh, the resin instead of going over. And the last pour that I did, I was I had mismeasured and had a little bit left over. So I think I waited about a week before I peeled this packing tape off. Wanted to make sure that it was uh, completely cured. And there was really no damage. I thought there would be a little bit of damage. There was a little bit of scarring, uh, but it, it did not pull off any of the uh, project itself. It just left behind this uh, ridge, the scar that uh, the glue had produced in sealing it. And the same thing happened uh, with the, the cave water feature. You can see right there the, uh, the scar left behind. So I went back in and, and fixed that. But So measuring out uh, the height and width of the actual falls and putting that measurement onto a piece of wax paper and then applying this uh, product. All of the products will be listed in the... Uh, in the more description, more info section of this video as far as a material list. So I'm going to use some of that same glue that sealed it and uh, try to fix this, uh, this ridge, this seam or scar that happened and really just trying to create a more level uh, look instead of having that ridge upturned. So creating some texture on the top water feature and this is something I will later dry brush with white to create those uh, rapids. So cutting out the uh, waterfall and spraying some water onto the wax paper this just makes it easier to be able to remove that wax paper and making sure that this is going to fit and once you know it's actually going to work putting this onto a piece of plastic and this so something I got at an office supply store, really meant for if you're turning into in a report for school. So using some of this plastic, I'm going to go ahead and try to bend the top of it to create that uh, shape of water falling. And this is really to just help keep the waterfall shape. So I'm going to apply glue, apply this to this piece of plastic, and this will hopefully prevent it from warping uh, or changing shape after it's been glued on. So I've got a couple of different really small brushes here. I'm going to try to practice creating ripples. So I've got a practice piece here and I had never really worked with a scale this small concerning water. And so it's a good idea to try to practice uh, these ripples. It's very difficult to fix it if it's uh, if it's not working. So before that, I'm going to paint the tops of all of these rocks. So all of the rocks that uh, have a portion sticking out of the water, uh, like you can really see the difference here with the color that of the rocks that are under the water, as opposed to that color uh, out of the water. And then dry brushing 
those rocks that are sticking out of the water and creating some ripples for the cave feature. And that was a good way of practicing before I moved on to the lake. Uh, putting in some, applying some of that same high gloss glue. Again, it'll be in the uh, materials list and the more information. And this is really just to get rid of the seams that happened because of the packing tape. And going through and trying to create some ripples with that water area where the waterfall hits. And putting some of that same stuff it took to create the waterfall to actually glue it into place. And then brushing some of that same stuff backward in trying to uh, blend it with that water feature up top. So gluing down on the bottom and then dry brushing some shadow color before I dry brush on uh, some white. So that shadow color is basically a gray with a little bit of blue combined. So using white acrylic paint here to uh, simulate that uh, break in the water where it uh, turns that foamy white. So at the top of the waterfall I've got, you've got that break point where it's kind of in the shape of like a sawtooth shape uh, where you're, the water's uh, turning white. And then on top, trying to dry brush uh, that texture to create that white water uh, look up top. And then decided the, the actual falls were just a little too thin. They look too thin, so using some of that same product to build that up and uh, enable it to have a little more volume. And then applying the uh, glue for trying to create the texture for that cascade area. So creating as small a ripples as I can possibly create with those brushes because uh, the scale is so small. So there you're seeing it after that dries and I'm working in very small sections because the layer is so thin, it'll dry on you really quickly. So you have to work quick and work in these very uh, small sections and creating more ripples. So working continuously outward to I get to the uh, uh, end of that lake and uh, dry brushing here, the bottom of the falls. So all of that texture I applied uh, easily uh, bring that out later in a process of dry brushing white. And then noticing in the uh, reference photos that this area of where that water is continuing after it hits, uh, there's quite a few areas where the, the white sections are opaque. So doing a combination of dry brushing and then quite a bit of just having a solid white to suggest uh, just how much friction is going on in that area. And then going back in with a really small brush, trying to uh, enhance and incorporate some extremely small detail. So jumping back and forth with different uh, sections of the project and try to keep camouflaging that ridge or scar that happened because of the glue. So trying to paint it a similar color as to the rest of the project and then going back in and uh, dry brushing different colors on top of it. So dry brushing some white onto that cascade area and getting progressively uh, less as I go out towards the edge of the lake. So you can see I made a little mistake there. You can just wipe that off with the finger or a wet rag and dry brushing more of that detail. You can see all of those little ridges that uh, the glue left behind and creating that texture and you can go back in with a really small brush and add uh, quite a bit more uh, white foam and creating a water line with some of the rocks you can see even though this paintbrush is extremely small that it's just too thick of a, a line to look realistic so you can take a pen and remove a good percentage of that or you can just use the pin and dip it into paint and create water lines that way. So, and then going over the, uh, all of the sections where I'm painting white acrylic paint, cause that will dry really dull 
and we're wanting this to look wet. So I'm using some of that same product that is a high gloss glue. And I think I applied uh, five different layers to each water area that has uh, white acrylic paint to try to reestablish that wet look. And still working on that, trying to blend um, that area where there was the scar. And now time to plant some trees. I think I had over 120 of these pine trees. So this is definitely an area that is uh, in the reference photos of the waterfall that this is based on. So applying some glue to a whole bunch of different areas and then putting in some actual gravel and larger rocks here and there just to kind of tie everything together so it was maybe 20 percent actual rocks and the rest were made out of foam so applying some glue and using some model railroad foliage to try to break up that look of just having ground cover and then doing the same thing up top putting some model railroad uh, foliage into a coffee grinder to get a different uh, scale or look and it just adds a nice complex look to the landscape. And then painting on some layers of that uh, high gloss sealant to the waterfall itself, just to make sure that it's got that shine and look of, uh, of actual water. So a good way of coloring the uh, ground cover, instead of making more ground cover that is of a different color, is to just dry brush those areas and uh, got a light yellow there. So you can see it here where I've tried to mimic the color of the uh, dead pine needles, where I've dry brushed a little bit of that burnt orange in that particular section. So all of that orange really bringing a lot of color to the project. And applying some glue and using a much darker model railroad uh, foliage to break up uh, quite a few of those areas where there might be too many rocks just to again bring a a different look to the landscape and then kind of as a last stage using a matte finish to apply one good layer to everything this uh, obviously helping everything to making sure everything is glued down but protecting the paint as i'm doing here just that one layer will really make the entire project last much longer and then as a very last stage, applying some watered down glue to the base of the falls and then attaching some cotton, allowing that to dry and then pulling up on the cotton and sometimes uh, pulling some of it away to create that look of mist, applying some uh, sealant on the side there and as if the mist from the waterfall is climbing up one side of the falls. Also can help you hide a bad edge to the fall. So there you have it, Waterfall Gorge, lake with a cave underneath the waterfall. So be sure and leave a comment as to your guess as to which waterfall in the United States that this is based on. And as always, thanks for watching.